Um, the first thing I'm going to say, everybody, is that I have used um, different forms of dating here. So you can see I've got BC in some of these. Some of them say KA, which means thousands of years ago. Some say BCE, which is before current era. However, the dates in the Upper Paleolithic are always plus or minus thousands of years. So it, I don't think the, the date is particularly important in the wider scheme of things. Now, what I really want to talk about is, is not so much the whole of the Upper Paleolithic. Um, first of all, I'm not technically expert enough. What I'm particularly interested in, in this is what seems to have been like a cultural and, and cognitive revolution uh, at this time. The human beings really do seem to be coming quite symbolic. And most of this is, is covering modern humans in Eurasia. So here we go. The, oh, I've got to uh, start my... There we are. Paleolithic terminology. This is something that actually quite difficult to get your head around. It goes lower early, just 2.6 million years ago to 250,000 years ago, middle 250,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago, the initial upper Paleolithic, and that changes. Some people now are arguing that that started as early as 200,000 years ago. Some people are actually saying it's 40,000 years ago and then the upper Paleolithic, and again, there's lots of other, well, not arguments, it really, there's lots of debates about the changing dates. Different dating methods have given us different dates. More recent archaeological finds have questioned some of the older ideas. So it is actually a little bit fluid at the moment, the actual Paleolithic terminology. But effectively, lower early is really when, when you're talking about the precursors of modern human beings. The middle is where you're actually beginning to get what you call modern human beings to, to look at and, and to DNA, but perhaps not at a cognitive level. And then the initial um, Paleolithic is, is where you start to see symbolism and things change. And then the upper Paleolithic, which I'm concentrating on, is the time when where people have said there's almost a revolution. Now, the other thing I say about the upper Paleolithic is that it has many names of flint and stone assemblage, which are labeled cultures, I'm afraid I'm not actually expert enough to discuss the various types of flint and various cultures that actually go in across, but it isn't the focus of this talk. So I hope you forgive me. I don't really want to take very technical questions on flints. I've got to be honest, even though I'm an archeologist and prehistorian and you really have to study flints, I really prefer to leave that to the science experts. So the beginnings, so Homo sapiens us, Pretty much it's agreed we originated in Africa during the, what is now the middle Paleolithic use of our terminology. And the possible homeland is East Africa. There on the diagram on the map are, are, are sort of countries where people think modern human beings could well have originated from. So by about 50,000 to 40,000 years ago, humans have spread across nearly all the continents, with obviously exception of Antarctica, of course, but not actually into the Americas, we'll come on to that. The problem is, is that there's been quite a lot of uncertainty in the timing of the character of the dispersal out of Africa. DNA has actually um, cast lights on this. Different times seem to have, have, have occurred. And the old idea that we all came out of Africa once has actually been questioned as well. There might have been people coming out of Africa that didn't spread very far. Uh, into Europe in the first place, but it's only got as far as, as places like Israel and the Levant. So the data at present fits with several different models and time. And some of the older radiocarbon dates, and radiocarbon, I should say, isn't much good after about 50,000 years ago, but some of those have been questioned. The more modern um, ways of doing radiocarbon has changed some of the dates. DNA evidence, as I said, have changed older ideas as well. And the thing that we really want to concentrate on here is that other Paleolithic people are referred to as anatomically modern humans, AMH. And that's quite important because you will sometimes in the literature see things talk about archaic humans. And these are people that look very human, but were actually considered not to be modern humans. So the roots out of Africa. So this is an interesting diagram. There really was a good suggestion that about 74,000 years ago, that the 
parts of what is now Yemen and, and southern Saudi Arabia were much more fertile than they are now. They were actually green oases, rivers running down them. And there is a very good suggestion that people actually migrated out of Africa across that route, going down the green routes. And the reason that this is I'm following the coast, the reason this is a, a now considered to be the case is that it does seem that people were in Australia at least 40,000 years ago, possibly even earlier than that. And that rather questions the early ideas that um, we only came out of Africa around that time. So the red route is actually a sort of dispersal that people think happened 46,000 years ago. And there should be another arrow on this red route. It wasn't on the thing because the red route actually would actually include people coming across into Europe. So there's that. Now, both of these routes actually have got people that seem to have mated with Neanderthals, which actually were spread across Europe and across Siberia, um, perhaps not further down in, into India or, or to Australia, but it does appear that we mated with Neanderthals on more than one occasion. And then there is, I'm going to do a plug here for a very good book. I'm not going to discuss Neanderthals very much, but if you're interested, this is the book to read, Kindred by... Rebecca Rag Sykes. It's one of the best books on Neanderthals I think I've ever read, and I would recommend it. There was another ancient human group coming out of, uh, that we met rather when we were coming out of Africa, uh, the Denisovians, I think that's how it's pronounced, and they bred with both human beings and with Neanderthals. And in fact, they found remains of what appears to be a first generation Neanderthal Denisovian child. So they were very thin. But there's a big problem about these people. There's only been two sites in caves where there's been some teeth found and some small bones. Now they have extracted the genome, so we do have the DNA, and we can actually see DNA in Tibetans and other East Asians. So there's absolutely no doubt that these people occupied quite a lot of land in Siberia and that we actually, um, modern humans, I say we, we actually did mate with these people but there's almost no cultural remains left of them. There isn't really very much we can say, except that that's where they, they were. And that's quite intriguing, really, because it means if you're going back, you know, sort of 50,000 years um, ago, you might have actually had three different sorts of human beings. And I think that's also important to stress. Neanderthals and Devonians now are seen as human beings because if we can mate with them, they're really the same species as us. And what they are really is just different sorts of human beings. Um, this whole idea that Neanderthals were some missing link or, or some kind of brute sort of figure has long been dismissed. And as I say, Rebecca Ragsight's book really puts all those old ideas to rest. So that's actually where we get to in terms of where we're coming from there. This is an earlier uh, map from Spinkins, uh, an uh, archaeologist at York University. And this is suggesting, again, the kind of dates of people coming out and migrating across. And as you can see, the arrows going across into the Americas, the dates there are much later than everywhere else. However, again, those dates now are considered to be actually too late. And there have been some suggestions that people might have got across into Alaska about 25,000 years ago. And people actually spread down into South America and were there uh, really quite along down by at least 14,000 and possibly more. So all of these dates and, and, and routes suggested are really still being debated. And as new evidence comes to, to light, people are actually looking at this. So this is the thing that I really want to talk about, the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. And the suggestion that us, atomically modern humans, underwent a cognitive transformation. And what we mean by that is that we can't see in the physical remains of people, in the skeletons, which is really all we've got left, very much actually what's going on. We can't even see much in the DNA, but it does seem that there was a widespread cultural change. And there's been a, a suggestion that language developed to the point or encompass symbolic concepts, whereas obviously the suggestion is before that it didn't. Of course, there's no way that we'll ever really know this. We can see how people have evolved culturally and we can see how we've got to here. But exactly what happened is, is 
endless debate. This is the great fun of being prehistorian, of course. The whole fact is there's no history, so we will never properly know. But what does the appearance of armour in various forms signify? And this is really one of the questions when I studied in the Upper Paleolithic that really fascinated me, because we do seem to have a real burst of artistic uh, culture across human beings about 40, 50,000 years ago. So these uh, recently discovered uh, pictures in caves. Um, they're in, in Indonesia, uh, Ivan Swayze. And you can see on the left-hand picture, you can see hand stencils. And these things are really ubiquitous in a lot of Upper Paleolithic paintings in caves. You find hand stencils that are spread right across Eurasia. And then this one, there's a picture of a hairy pig. And this has been suggested that this is actually perhaps the first uh, representation of an animal, the first naturalistic representation of an animal. And again, here, if you can see, there's hand stencils here as well. So this is actually people really looking at the world and thinking about it differently, it seems, from what we did before. And there, I think I put them on, obviously, they're not Eurasia. I said there's many Eurasia. I put them there because they're fairly recent finds. Um, and, and they do, if these people have got all the way to those, those, those caves by 45,000 years ago, it does suggest that those early routes out of Africa must have been used. So that's really where we are. When you look at Europe, and this is what I'm trying to do in Eurasia, you can find quite a lot of sites that seem to be linked to each other. The earlier Upper Paleolithic are the red and pink sites, mm -hmm. and the late ones, the blue ones, are the late middle, the earlier Paleolithic sites. Now, there's no doubt I think that the red ones are taken to be Homo sapiens, modern ones, but the blue ones may be Homo sapiens, but some people have suggested that the Neanderthals, and there has been some findings now of Neanderthals using some sort of paint and, and, and some sort of expression, and then wondering actually how much the two species interacted with each other. It's very difficult because in some places that, that before people thought the Neanderthals lasted very much into the, the current, um, the middle of the uh, Upper Paleolithic, it's now been suggested, in fact, that there were thousands of years between caves being used by Neanderthals and caves being used by modern humans. But there's an interesting selection of sites there. So what we then find is something that we haven't really found in the record refined artwork and quite sophisticated artwork. To date, this is the oldest Carl, Carl figure found um, in, a, in a cave in, in Germany. And obviously this is some kind of symbolism because it's, it's called a lion man. And again, yet again, this was reconstructed out of uh, many pieces. Uh, there has been a debate that it hasn't been reconstructed the, uh, in the correct way. But for the moment, the actual perfect reconstruction of it, to, to my mind, isn't so important. What's so important is that this is actually quite an amazing carving because it, it's actually quite complex. Somebody must have envisaged this before they started carving it. So there is not much before this that actually gives us the idea that somebody could actually do this. But of course, there's one thing that us prehistorians must always remember wood doesn't survive very well in the archaeological record. It is always a real treat when we find things made of wood in prehistory or anything organic. And so whilst these, this, this is made of ivory, which has survived, were there things made of wood beforehand? Now, there's been debate about what this means. Is it a mixture of a man or a lion? Or is it a shaman taking on the spirit of a lion? There's been a lot of studies of shamans in, in Siberia that seem to um, have very similar lifestyles as, as some early hunter-gatherers. And, and shamans do seem to be quite, quite a ubiquitous early form of religion expression, particularly amongst um, hunter-gatherers and more complex hunter-gatherer societies. And then the question is, is it, is it an expression of religion? Is this some kind of spirit, some kind of God, some kind of spirit of the animal? Or another suggestion, is it a group talisman? 
is this this a symbol of the lion people that, that called themselves the lion people perhaps because they lived in an area where there were lots of lions because of, at this time 40,000 years ago Europe would have had plenty of lions in them so it comes to another problem here because obviously um, hunter-gatherers at this period um, were considered to be quite small bands, perhaps 25 people, perhaps 40 people. So for somebody to put the time and effort into making sight like this, was this actually a special person? And I hate to use the word specialist, but of course that's what's done because surely people must have all been um, helping in hunting and gathering because it is a lifestyle where, where you've not got food reserves for very long. So it's an interesting expression of symbolism. And this, as the final line of the slide says, it does show modern human cognition. Then there's actually quite a few cavings of actual animals. And this is a horse carving. Um, a thing to say here, by the way, is that wild horses were covered the Eurasian plain at the time, and they were one of the main things that people hunted. So don't get the idea that this is any kind of domestic horse. Um, people didn't domesticate horses in, into very late prehistory. So this is a, a horse carving, and you can very much see, obviously it's worn and a little battered, but you can very much see that it is somebody that understands horses. If you look along um, the back of it, it does appear to have been almost some sort of mane or tail being carved in there. And again here, if you look along the top, and these are small things. These, these are portable things that you would carry with you very small sort of carvings. One thing I would say is, is, as you might notice, a few of these finds are from Germany, caves in Germany. And I don't think it's because they were particularly concentrated in Germany. I just think that there's been more discoveries of German archeologists. So obviously it was in a cave that Neanderthals were originally found near Dusseldorf in the Neander Valley. Then this is an interesting thing. This is what they call a Venus. I, I do hate that word because unfortunately it carries so much baggage with it, Venus, the idea of goddesses, the idea of beautiful women, the, the idea of paintings. Um, it, it really is an unfortunate word. Uh, but these Venus, Venus figures are found across Eurasia and, and, and they seem to exist for thousands of years. And they do tend to be what we these days call obese women with, with very large buttocks, large bums, uh, large breasts. But the interesting thing about these is that they've been made in different materials. And since they're actually spread across lots of bands of hunter-gatherers, this indicates that distant groups of upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers had some level of shared culture and beliefs. There must have been some kind of um, um, connection with spirits or gods or whatever. So that's actually one of the things that I, I feel really does show that there is a conceptual leap of people. As ever with uh, any of these objects, the debate about what they signify include, is it a fertility goddess or fertility symbol? Is it part of a shaman or a shame woman's toolkit? Is it some kind of a thing that a spiritual person would have? Is it a prestige item of a powerful or wise woman? Is it a reaction to glacial conditions? Is what well, there's some um, slightly more environmental determinist, the idea that um, it was difficult to actually have children if you were too, too um, thin, uh, and that fat symbolized fertility and childbearing. And so somehow this was an, uh, a reaction to people struggling. I really personally don't believe that because um, I don't see that there's any particular population drop off during some of the glacial periods. Um, there's also, of course, been the, this idea, it's early erotica, uh, and they did pictures of real or idealised women. Well, that could well be true. I mean, I'm not denying that isn't the case, but, but it, it, it seems to me to be a, a more modern idea when people start talking about erotica there. It, it seems too difficult. There's no doubt that perhaps they were some kind of fertility sy symbol in terms of trying to arouse people, perhaps, but I don't think that um, hunter-gatherers would have been particularly into modesty. I think people would understand what the human form looked like. I think nudity as such would, wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have, um, they would have had clothes, but it wouldn't have been the kind of thing that it is now. But it, 
it's very difficult to say what the cultural role is, but I, I think it's the, the form that's important. This is actually showing that women, women, pictures or symbols of women were really, really important across the whole of the Eurasian Upper Paleolithic. Here's a different one. Again, another the, the other Venus of Will and Dorf. I mean, oh dear. Um, one of the problems with some of these things is that they're not pre precisely datable um, if, if they're stone. So what they're actually being dated by is, is, is the, the context that they're found in. And again, this is small. I've, I've put in here an idea is it's only about four inches, four and a bit inches tall. So you could actually carry this and it's made of limestone. So we've seen these made of different stone, we've seen, seen um, the, these made of ivory. And the head, there's been a lot of debate. Was it a headdress? Was it plated hair on the head? Um, it's difficult to know what it was. Um, but the, the, although the, there are obviously suggest these are the arms going across, in some of these figures, there does seem to be something that, that where they might have actually had um, clothing suggested. So when you start to look across Europe, and I'm sorry this slide's a, a, a little bit fuzzy, when you look across Europe, you, you find another thing that starts to come up. You find people actually making personal ornaments. So this is a, a picture of sites with work deer teeth. And these deer teeth to be, be, well, to be personal ornaments, probably pendants, but they may be necklaces, or they could have been sewn into clothing. Uh, lo lots of um, uh, hunter-gatherers, more modern ones, sew um, bright things into their clothing uh, to actually do this. And again, these seem to be spread uh, for the Levant all the way across Europe. I mean, and again, although the map seems to show clusters around the Pyrenees, um, that's partly because there's, there's caves there that have been found. It doesn't necessarily mean that these kind of deer pendants weren't spread uh, much further across. But of course, in an open air site, there's such small things. They either wouldn't have survived or we wouldn't actually have found them. So this, again, the problem about the Upper Paleolithic going back so far is that there is quite a scarcity of evidence, uh, apart from some places where you know, obviously in caves, things have been, been um, protected from the environment. This is um, a mammoth, which has been caved from a, 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 a wall of a cave. Um, and you can see it's been picked out in relief. And this is actually, again, quite a good picture of a mammoth. It gives you quite a good idea of what it was. And, and it's perhaps the sort of spirit of the animal that people are trying to capture here, which I think is quite interesting. And there is a lot of cave art in France. Again, some of it's been found and, and looked for. Um, there's been a suggestion that um, during one of the glaciers or one of the glacial periods where it's particularly cold, people came down from where the glaciers had, had advanced into the north of Europe, into some of the valleys and things further down south, which were quite uh, good refuges from, from the actual ice. So yeah, the, these things, I feel, are all linked, these small portable figures, um, the, the different kinds of things that might be spiritual, might be religious, the personal ornaments that seem to be shared across. As I say, you can also track different flint styles and tall styles that seem to be shared across different regions. So there does seem to be a lot of connection between people in the Upper Paleolithic. They don't seem to be isolated bands. One of the things that certainly the Mesolithic people are now thinking about is that people actually came together at certain times a year, perhaps for festivals and things like that. And so small groups are in 25 to 40 to 50 people, perhaps hundreds of people came together at certain sites. The problem being is most of these sites would have already been open air and it is very, very difficult to find any evidence for it. But if you have a shared culture that has to spread some way and you've got shared ideas, that doesn't mean that you're linked to your neighbours and your further neighbours away. Obviously, these are very famous, these cave paintings from France, and there's over 100 sites in Europe with cave art. Again, we have a problem about reliable dates in some of these things. I mean, there have been attempts now to date the uh, charcoal. There's also a way of um, when there's the, uh, deposit mineral deposits on top of the paintings, you can get uranium, thorium dates from them. And they in some ways actually give us an idea of um, what time the paint, yeah, that they hold things must be at least. And again, some of these, these 
pictures and if you just look these up actually on, on, on Wikipedia or something on, on, online, some of these are really, really naturalistic pictures and they show an amazing appreciation of the animals and obviously these are the animals people hunt in. And this particular one here where you see the, the, the rhino with a long horn and you see this is almost like it's an impressionist of movement, capturing movement. And again, with these horses, and I go back to saying these were prey animals, not domestic horses, these really do seem to be caught in the gallop. And this then, uh, so you horse there, but here you've got um, what could well be an ancient auroch, aurochs being the precursors to cows, although they were much, much bigger, so at least double the size, many of them, and quite formidable things to hunt. So Again, this is a shared conception of the natural world. Coming back to this idea of an upper Paleolithic um, cultural revolution, people really do seem to be looking at the world in a different way, expressing the world in a different way, carrying things with them that are, that are portable art. These, this is something that's changed, or at least perhaps it's something that's evolved culturally, and it's the first time we've really got a lot of evidence for it. Um, there could well be that people had this level of cognition much earlier than we, we think now, but there's really not been that much evidence for it. Well, I thought, don't want to miss out on, on Britain, and I've actually been to Creswell Crags actually with the university. Uh, and unfortunately, although there are some cave paintings there, not, there's no pigments really survived and that you really do have to look. But this is a piece of portable art. If you look here, this is a horse's head. You can just follow it here. So somebody has got a, a rib fragment, uh, I'm not sure which animal to be honest, and, and actually has just carved something like that. And, and again, that makes you feel, well, somebody's actually took the time and effort to do that. And that, that's something that you, know, you could put in your, your pocket or your pouch of pocket perhaps is the, the wrong word for the, the clover and the upper pale, I think. But what I'm trying to say is this, this is portable. You can see the eye there and the ear. And again, it actually looks, it's, it's actually done quite symbolically. It's actually trying to capture the essence of the horse. Uh, next down here, and you can see, you know, almost blowing in the wind, perhaps. That this is actually something that, that, that that's different from what's gone on before. Um, there's not much Upper Paleolithic archeology span in Britain, actually. There, there have been some, um, um, Flints around the Star Car site or, or the, the ancient Lake Flicks, Lake Flicks down there, they found some, some things there. But the glaciers came down quite a long way in, in, uh, in Britain. So there, there doesn't seem to have been that much up a Paleolithic um, occupation at the time. The other thing that comes out, which is really about art and really thinking about, is that it's got the first evidence for music making. And so we, they've actually found bird bones, and, and bird bones are hollow, so obviously, you know, because the birds fly, yeah, it's, uh, um, so they're light. And they found hollows with holes drilled into them, which they think of flutes. Um, I've, I've seen articles too that argue these aren't flutes, but it does seem that somebody has actually made what looks to be an instrument. Some of the caves of artwork have acoustic qualities, which, which is something that people are only just beginning to realise. And of course, some of these caves of artwork were actually filled with a lot of sediment. And the only real way that you'd actually know if the cave had a particular acoustic quality was if you take all the sediment out and get the cave back to the kind of dimensions that it would have been when the people were living there. And so, of course, that's not always been done. And perhaps in some places with things like rock falls and things, it, it can't be done. I come back to this thing about organic materials. Drums made of wood and skin are unlikely to survive. And in some ways, one of the easiest ways to make music and stuff is banging two hollow pieces of wood together. And would you have had other kind of organic um, things, things that you could rattle, gourds? Um, there's a wealth of things that you could make a sound from um, which really wouldn't survive. But music, and this is an important thing, I mean, modern conceptions of music, and I mean us modernly, we go to a concert to listen to a band or to an orchestra or to watch an opera. But at the same time, there's been a great rise in choirs. People have seen how beneficial singing in a choir is recently. TV programmes now about choirs have made up of very, very ordinary people. 
I tend to feel in the upper Paleolithic, I mean, everybody would have been making music together. I don't think there might have been somebody that could specialist play a particular instrument, but I think this is a very communal and a very social activity. And if you've got a cave with artwork in it and it's, it, it echoes well with music, it's a great way of bonding. Um, I imagine everybody has seen you know, even the old fashioned Westerners with, with um, you know, uh, uh, Indians, uh, so-called Red Indians, terrible description of uh, indigenous people, but dancing around the campfire with the drums and things like that. And rather, rather that's a very stereotypical way of portraying people and stuff like that. It, if you actually think about it, you can get some idea of, of the way that people dancing together and the way that people making noise together or just stamping their feet or clapping or singing really brings people together and bonding. And particularly if some of these caves actually were, were used by a number of different groups, not just they were yeah, inhabited by one group. And, and some of these caves might not actually have been inhabited all the time. They might have been very, very special places. So music is a very communal and social activity. So I found this, there's, there's been things that have been lying in museums all over the world that, that people didn't realize what they were. And this has actually just been rediscovered in Toulouse Museum. And it, it's horn from a French cave. And the French cave have a, a, a pain, so it's made from a conch cell. And the important thing about this particular thing is the conch shell, the cave is actually fairly inland in France. And the conch shell obviously has, has come from the Northern Atlantic and it's actually been traded in that case. I'm, I'm certainly not gonna, I'm, um, we're recording this, so I'm not gonna read all of this, but effectively what, what experts now think is that people put a mouthpiece through it here, that it's been modified to, to make it work. And, and that you could actually, by blowing in it, get a number of notes out of it. And here's a picture of a little upper Paleolithic person blowing from it. And this is, this is somebody that must have really understood what they were doing to do this. This hasn't come out of nowhere. I do wonder how many of these kind of things from our, our old archaeological digs have been discarded, bits of shells, oh, they were eating shellfish and people haven't really looked at it. And as I say, you know, this, it wasn't even realized what it was when it's actually there. And, and to my mind, the music and the artwork go together, They're the same kind of communal shared culture and the symbolic shared culture, which I think is really, really the point about the revolution that we're talking about during this period. So you've got art that was portable and static. The static art is the cave paintings, but at the same time as the cave paintings, you've got figurines and carvings all small enough to be carried. So the, the conception of art wasn't in one form. You've got artwork, which is two-dimensional on caves. You've got three-dimensional figurines. You've got some cave, cave um, sculptures effectively that are three-dimension. So that's actually, um, something that I think is really, really important because I think everybody was making the art. That the painters might have been special, perhaps the colors might be special, but I can't see there was just a group of artists. This must have been a shared endeavor with lots of people. And then this individuality coming out, and people seem to have pendants and necklaces and, and things sewn into clothes. So this really, to, to my mind, uh, makes me feel that yes, people were very communal, very much part of a group but also their sort of identity has been expressed by what they're wearing, what they're, what they're doing. And there is, there is a way then really of, you are part of a group, but you're an individual as well. And this is such a, a, a modern thing for us, we don't even think about it. We all know, you know, we're a member of the Upper Wharfdale Heritage Group. We're a member of the University of 3H. We're a member of this, we're a member of that. It just seems completely natural. But a symbolic idea of being shared, not just being a member of like a hunting group, but being a member of something that's got artistic culture, I think is, is a particular part of the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. <coughs> Excuse me. So the cave art, the hand stencils are interesting. Are they actually somebody saying, I was here? Because how they were made, somebody must have took the pigment into their mouth and either use it a tube or spit in, but I have a tendency to blown against the cave. So you put the hand there and you've blown around it and you've left your 
a, a silhouette of your handprint, are you signing it? Are you saying that you were part of this cave? Are you saying you're part of this community? Um, was it only special people did that? But that's interesting because we've actually found some, some hand stencils, as they're called, of children in some cases. So, so what was the child an apprentice or did just everybody do it? Could you go along and just stamp things? And the other thing that I've always wondered here, and again, the problem is dating these things. As I say, it's very difficult to date it. Well, are these all made at the same time? There's some caves with lots of hand stencils. Were there a group of people that did all the hand stencils at the same time as they're doing that? Or were they done at different periods of time? And, and that's important too, because that just does that just mean one person was doing it and then somebody else was going along and putting their mark there afterwards? Or was it the feeling of group solidarity that they were all doing it together? I also think that there's a real amount of artistic flair in this period. I mean, that the cave art, um, I could have just done a whole presentation, I think, on, on some of the wonderful pictures there, but they are really very, very nice. And they've, they've done now um, a reconstruction of them because you can't go into the original caves because um, people's breath was um, decaying the artwork. So they've done a complete reconstruction. Uh, I actually haven't been, but I really do want to. So this though does suggest specialists and shared cultures over wide areas. I do think that you would have to serve an apprenticeship to actually do some of these things, particularly the carving, particularly the idea of carving something out of a piece of limestone, a piece of rock. You have to have the image of what you're carving there. But I also, if you look at um, ancient people, I also, we have found evidence in, in, in certainly the Mesolithic of children being taught how to flint nap, because flint napping, if you think, uh, I don't know how much people know about it, but flint napping, when you've got a block of flint and you're cutting or hitting it with hammers and the hammers or whatever to, to make pieces break off. You have to have an idea of what you're trying to do. You have to think in 3D. And there's no doubt that there are apprentice flint nappers. Children were shown how to do it. I also think that flint napping in, in, in this period wasn't a specialist task. I think everybody would have a basic idea. You might have somebody that were in the group that was better at it than other people. But flints were such a basic tool, I'm sure everybody could do it. So some of the conceptualization about making statues and things by thinking in 3D would perhaps have come originally from working flint, and that's completely supposition on my part, impossible to know. But it, I think this is wide areas I've put in there. It suggests it's shared culture or cultures over wide areas. And the big question is why is such an explosion of symbolic expression? Some people have, have talked again, like I say, about syntax of language. Some people have suggested there was DNA change with us. What is important about art? It is definitely, I think, an indicator of cultural evolution. And I stress the word cultural evolution because there doesn't seem to have been much physical evolution from 50,000 years ago to us. There's been a little bit, but not much. Other tools in Flintstone also become more complex during this period. In fact, they've changed quite a lot. When we get to Mesolithic, they change completely. I've seen a suggestion that mixing with Neanderthals might have sparked change, that somehow or other seeing different people might have made people think differently about themselves. Um, again, it's one of those interesting ideas, my way of, of, of doing it. Of course, we have in archaeology to pay a lot of attention to the environment and climate change. And of course, climate change now is a, a big topic. And there's also always been quite a thing about climate change driving evolution and climate change, you know, making people think. And I, I'm not going to say that, that, that climate change might not have been a factor. Obviously, the climate when you're hunter gatherer is absolutely vital to you. But I don't really like a lot of environmental determinism when you're talking about symbolism. It might have changed the kind of animals that you hunted. When the mammoths died out, you eat horses. When the forests come along, you go from eating horses, which are really plains animals, to eating red deer that, believe it or not, were originally forest animals, or aurochs, which were originally forest animals. But I'm, I'm, I don't want to blame it all on the climate. That, that seems more, excuse it all on the climate, blame is a strange word. So do share cultural licks and ideas engender innovation. Now, this is a really modern idea, and it does seem to be the fact that when you share ideas with people, that you do actually come up with new things. 
And as we've seen, sort of the more sharing and people talk about teamwork and, and stuff, that does seem to be that people actually do culturally evolve if you're actually linking up with people, especially with people that are slightly different from you, but you can still communicate with. So every society since the Upper Paleolithic values art. Um, and art, of course, has become a specialism now and in our modern thing that we have, we talk about artistic things and stuff. Uh, and I was going to say in this and be a little bit flippant, well, nearly everybody until recently, uh, but I don't want to get into government funding of the arts. Um, I just want to move on to one thing. The Mesolithic period, which I'm more of an expert in than the Upper Paleolithic, obviously follows the, um, the period I've been talking about. And this idol, Shagat idol, was found in a peat bog. Now, peat bogs are aerobic, so that they, they don't decay. Organic things survive in places that are very wet, don't have very much oxygen. And as I've said a couple of times during this presentation, we don't find much wood from the Upper Paleolithic. In fact, I'm not sure that we found any. And this particular thing, it was found in the middle Urals in Russia. So really bang in the middle of where Upper Paleolithic people were, were living. Um, unfortunately, it was found in 1890 and some bits of it um, have now have been lost. I mean, there are old drawings of it. And again, it is a thing that you can look up. But this, this is, and again, um, this is another thing, by the way, as I was talking about the light man, there's been debates about actually how the reconstruction has been put together. Um, but that's often the case. But I don't really, again, think that, that matters too much. The point is, this is definitely an idol. It's definitely sort of a, a person, or at least the head of a person. And, and it's definitely symbolism. It really is incredibly symbolic. And it may have stood over five metres tall. Now, at that point, I suppose, because it's wood, you could carry it, two or three of you, but maybe it was erected somewhere almost like a totem pole or to, uh, somewhere, maybe it meant something. Uh, the radiocarbon dates have dated this to sort of 10,000 BC, which is at the cusp, that's a very early uh, Mesolithic, that is actually um, bordering on, on, on the two periods. So does that have any scene that's in the Upper Paleolithic made of wood that we haven't found? And I, I put this in because I think this is really important about the fact that we're forever talking about stone, uh, we're ever talking about flints. I mean, sometimes we're, when we get to Neolithic, we're talking about pottery. We simply don't talk about wood enough in prehistory. So there we are. Uh, well, that's it really, um, what I wanted to say. I uh, hope you've all enjoyed it. I've got one last slide, and this has got some links on it and, and some, some things. There are a couple of videos here, that, um, including one guy that um, actually does some of the Paleolithic reconstructions and things, which are really very, very interesting and, and take, take what I've said in the stage further. So, and again, some of these papers up, and they're not, they're, not, they're not too technical, but if you're actually interested in, in taking things further, then actually these links would do it. So there we are. I hope you've all enjoyed that.